One of the things that I really enjoy doing as a podcaster and as an audiobook narrator is looking at other people's processes. I enjoy seeing the hardware that others are using, as well as their process from recording to final production. That really helps me to be a better podcaster and a better audiobook narrator, and I hope it does you as well. So in this episode, I want to give you a glimpse into my recording hardware chain, and we're going to talk a little bit about microphone interfaces or audio interfaces. So let's go. Hey friends, Mikey Adams here with the Audacity Channel podcast. The hardware chain that we might be using in our recording process can vary significantly. If you're using a USB microphone, then there's no need in your recording chain for an audio interface because obviously that USB microphone plugs directly into your computer. And your computer essentially becomes both the recorder and the audio interface. Some USB microphones will have a gain knob on them, some do not. Those that do have a gain knob give you the added ability to be able to control the gain of your microphone a little bit better. Those that don't rely on the software within your computer to adjust the volume or the gain level. But all USB microphones, as far as I know, provide a headphone jack on the microphone itself. And the advantage of that is that you can monitor what you're recording with zero latency. In other words, zero delay. You can hear what you're recording in real time. And that helps because if any anomalies get into your recording, you're going to hear those right away. And when you hear them right away, it gives you the ability to stop and redo that section or treat that section in whatever way you want to treat it. And that can save you some time in post-production editing. But if you're using an XLR microphone like I am right now, you're going to have to have some kind of audio interface between the microphone and your computer. And one of the main reasons for that is because our XLR microphones, and you know what I mean by XLR, we have the three-prong balanced plug that plugs directly into our audio interface or our microphone interface. And that XLR connection is a very low-level audio connection. And the function of your audio interface is to boost up that level enough so that you can get a good recording level in the software that you're using. Another function of that audio interface is to convert that low-level analog signal from your microphone into a digital signal of ones and zeros so that your computer knows what to do with it. In the next episode, we're going to be talking more about sample rates and bit depth, and it's at that point that we'll go into that topic a little bit deeper. But for now, I just want to mention that your audio interface is converting the analog signal from your analog microphone into a digital signal that your computer can understand and that Audacity or whatever DAW that you're using can do something with it. Because remember, our computers can't do anything with analog audio. For example, as Audacity is recording, it's recording a digital signal, not an analog signal. This is why when we have our headphones plugged into Audacity while we're recording, we can't hear anything because it hasn't been recorded yet. When Audacity plays that back, then we can hear it with our headphones plugged into our computer. And so similar to a USB microphone, the audio interface that we're using will have a headphone jack on it, or in some cases, multiple headphone jacks. And that gives us the ability to listen to our audio as we're recording it. And there are probably as many audio interfaces out there as there are microphones, and so to try and enumerate each one would be an exercise in futility. But they all function basically the same. They're all going to have some kind of a preamp in them so that the audio that you're recording records at a decent level. There are some good audio interfaces or microphone interfaces available that won't break your budget. One popular brand is the Focusrite Scarlett audio interface or microphone interface. You can get it in several different models. If you're podcasting by yourself or editing audiobooks, the Scarlett Solo third generation might be a good choice for you. My intention here isn't to promote one over another. I just wanted to make that known to you if that's something that you're looking for. If there's two of you recording your podcast and you're in the same room together, the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 third generation might fit your needs. And both of those options are good options. They have good electronics in them with low noise levels. So those might work well for you if you're looking or in the market for an audio interface to get you started. And like I mentioned a minute ago, there's a plethora of microphone interfaces or audio interfaces out there. 
You can simply go to Amazon's website or to Sweetwater's website and search for microphone or audio interfaces and see what comes up. But the important thing to remember or the important thing to know, especially if you're just now setting up your podcast, is that if you're using an analog XLR microphone, you're going to have to have some type of audio interface to connect to your computer. So let's talk for just a moment about what I use, what I have in my audio chain. Because like I said at the beginning, it always helps me to know what other people are doing. I'm always kind of curious to look behind the curtain, as it were, and see what other podcasters or audiobook narrators are using. So here's the system that I've got, and this is what I record with most often. My microphone is a Shure SM7B. The Shure SM7B is an amazing microphone. I love this microphone. It's got low noise. It's a dynamic microphone. It's unidirectional. It has a cardioid pickup pattern. And the audio that I get out of this microphone is exceptional. But there is one drawback to it. It is a very gain-hungry microphone. In other words, if you want to use the Shure SM7B, you've got a couple of options. You can crank the gain up on your audio interface. And by up, I mean way up. And depending on what kind of audio interface you're using, you might be able to get away with that. We'll talk more about that in just a moment when I talk about the audio interface that I'm using. But keep in mind that when we start cranking the gain up on our audio interface, it's going to produce more noise. And that noise will normally be in the form of a hissing sound. And the higher we turn the gain up, that hiss can increase and will increase. And that hissing sound gets into our recording. And so the objective most often is to have the gain as low as we can have it because that keeps those types of noises out of our recording. So in my recording chain, I've put a preamp in line with my interface. And the preamp that I'm using is a cloud lifter. There's other inline preamps like the Fethead, but I've used the cloud lifter for a long time and so that's kind of what I have. It's just personal choice. I'm not sure that one's better over the other but you might check the prices on each if that's something that you need to do. If you're using an XLR mic that's not real gain hungry, then using that inline audio preamp is probably unnecessary. And like I said, depending on your audio interface, it might be unnecessary even using something like the Shure SM7B or the RE320 or RE20, which are also gain hungry microphones. So I have my microphone plugged into my cloud lifter and then from my cloud lifter, I'm plugged into my DBX286S mic preamp, and processor. This is a single channel rack mounted mic processor or mic preamp and processor combined into one unit. And because I've got that cloud lifter plugged into the preamp section of my 286S, I have phantom power turned on because that cloud lifter requires phantom power. My microphone doesn't require it, but that cloud lifter preamp does. And it'll be the same with the Fethead preamp. It's going to require 48 volt phantom power. That 48 volt phantom power doesn't make it all the way to my microphone. It stops at the cloud lifter, but it's necessary for that cloud lifter to work. And what having that cloud lifter in line with my microphone allowed me to do is turn the gain down on my preamp. I can run this Shure SM7B without that cloud lifter, but I really have to crank up that preamp. I really have to work it hard and I don't want to work that preamp that hard. Thus, I have the cloud lifter with 48 volt phantom power. So let's talk about this 286S mic preamp and processor for just a moment. If you're not familiar with this, again, it's a single rack unit that can be rack mounted or just set on your desk. I have mine in a small rack and it contains six different sections. The first section I've already mentioned is the preamp. The preamp is where I'm setting my initial gain and I've set my initial gain to where I'm getting about a negative 12 dB on my peak audio as it's coming back out of this unit. And it also has some LEDs on it so I can tell if I'm clipping. So I have my level set to about two o'clock right now. If you have a DBX286S, you know what I mean. It's sitting about 1.30 or two o'clock and that is giving me good audio. Once in a while, I am getting up into the yellow light on that, but I'm never getting into the red because I don't want to clip anything. And then from the preamp, the audio is routed through a compressor. And I do use the compressor in this. All of my audio is compressed before it ever gets to Audacity. Or I guess I should say before it ever gets recorded. I don't use a lot of compression because when I over compress, my audio tends to get a little bit airy. 
So I put just enough compression on it to bring that dynamic range down where I get a good waveform that's consistent in the dynamic range, meaning that I don't have extreme peaks and I don't have extreme valleys. I have just enough compression on it to give me a really good looking waveform as it's being recorded. So if you use a DBX-286S, I have the drive on my compressor set at two, and I have the density set at about two and a half. And that's given me just enough compression again to get a good waveform that doesn't have extreme lows or extreme highs. And that means that I don't have so much leveling to do in post-production. Putting this amount of compression on my audio before it's recorded gives me a real consistent waveform in terms of the dynamic range. In other words, there aren't any extremes in my waveform. The next section in my 286S is a de-esser. For this microphone, I don't use the de-esser. I have it turned off. I do use the de-esser when I'm using my Cinco D2 shotgun microphone, but I'm not using that right now. In fact, it's packed away in a box somewhere waiting to be unpacked once we move. So for this mic, the Shure SM7B, I have my de-esser turned off. But when I'm using my Cinco D2 microphone, I do use it, and I have the frequency set at about 4 kilohertz so that it's notching out some of my essing. And then from the de-esser, the audio is routed to the enhancer. The enhancer gives me the ability to boost frequencies. I can boost the high frequencies or I can boost the low frequencies. When I'm using the Shure SM7B, I have both of those turned off or disabled. So I'm not enhancing any kind of frequency. I don't want that in my audio. I do that in post-production with equalization. I want a little more control over it, and I don't want any frequency adjustments being made before my audio is recorded. So I leave it flat. I leave them both at zero. So I'm not adding any low frequency. I'm not adding any high frequency to my recording. I like that flat response. And then the next section, section five here of the DBX-286 microphone preamp and processor is the enhancer slash gate. I do gate my audio a little bit with this. I'm in kind of a noisy environment, which I suppose is why I'm gating it just a little bit. I don't gate it a lot, but I gate it just enough to get rid of some background noise that I don't want in there that might be getting produced either in this room or outside of these walls. So I have it gated slightly. In case you're wondering, I have my threshold set at about 11 o'clock, and my ratio knob is straight up noon at a 2 to 1 ratio. And that gives me enough gating. Again, I don't want to overgate, because when we overgate, we run more of a risk of cutting off words or sounds at the beginning of our words and sentences. So I don't go overboard with the gate, but I do use it a little bit. And then as far as the output gain on this, which is the last section, I have that turned all the way down. In other words, the audio is leaving the DBX-286S without any additional amplification to it. And then from there, it's routed into the input of my Zoom H6 recorder. But before we talk about that, let me recap the 286. The 286S microphone processor, again, has six sections. And of those six sections, I use three of them. I use the preamp, obviously, because we got to have the microphone working. I then put a little bit of compression on it, and then I have it slightly gated. That's all I do with that. So that by the time my audio gets recorded, I've got good gain set on the preamp. I've got a little bit of compression to give me a nice looking symmetrical waveform, and I'm slightly gated to keep unwanted noises out of the audio. And that's it. And then that audio is routed again to the input of my Zoom H6 recorder. Now, unless I'm streaming something online, or if I'm talking to someone or interviewing someone or being interviewed by someone online, I don't even have my computer in this chain. I have my Zoom H6 set up to record. And so in this instance, right now, and in every episode of this podcast that I've ever done, my recording is done inside the Zoom H6. It's recorded there onto an SD card, and then I pop that SD card out of the Zoom H6, and I put it in my MacBook Pro, and I edit it there in Audacity. So let's take a look at the Zoom H6 here for just a moment. I've used this thing for years. I love this recorder and I've never had any problem with it at all. It gives me really good audio. I record in wave format at 48,000 hertz or 48 kilohertz. That's my sample rate. Again, next week we talk more about sample rates. I also record at a bit depth 
of 24 bits. And again, next week, I'll be talking more about bit depth and sample rates. But this gives me a real high quality audio. And because of the way that I have the 286 set up, my gain knob on the Zoom H6 is set to 3, which is really low. And it's given me a very low noise level. My noise floor is way down there. It's going to be somewhere between a negative 75 and a negative 80 dB. In other words, it's not silent, but it's pretty close. And that works really good for me. And again, if I'm streaming something or if I'm being interviewed or interviewing someone else and we're using a service like StreamYard, I will have my Zoom H6 set up not as a recorder, but as an audio interface so that my DBX286S is working as a microphone or an audio processor and my Zoom H6 is really set up for my audio interface. Now in the past, and no doubt sometime in the future as well, I have and I probably will at some point when I'm doing streaming audio, just take my microphone directly into the Zoom H6 through my cloud lifter. That works really well too. In other words, I bypass the DBX286S. I don't get optimal performance out of it, but if I'm ever in a situation where I can't have that DBX286 with me, then that's how I route my audio from my Shure SM7B into the cloud lifter into my Zoom H6 recorder. And if I'm recording remotely with someone, then I'll set up my Zoom H6 as an audio interface and I will connect it to my laptop and I'll set up whatever software I'm using on my laptop to recognize it and it becomes my audio interface. That works really good. Again, there are a number of audio interfaces out there and it would be impossible to enumerate all of them and talk about the advantages or disadvantages of each. YouTube is not lacking on videos for audio or microphone interfaces. Search YouTube and you'll get more information than you ever thought possible on microphone interfaces. So that's a brief look at my audio recording chain from my microphone to my cloud lifter to my audio processor to my Zoom H6 recorder. And then once I have that audio captured, again, I do all my content editing within Audacity and I apply my real-time effects there. And later, in episode 8 of this season, we're going to talk more about real-time effects in Audacity. Hey, and I wanted to remind you that there's only a couple of days left in March Madness. March Madness is the 50% off sale that's going on right now at the Audacity Bootcamp Online School. The Audacity Bootcamp Online School offers two courses on the use of Audacity. Audacity's step-by-step -step beginner to advanced is primarily for podcasters, but ACX audiobook narrators will get a lot out of it too. It's a deep dive into the inner workings of Audacity for spoken word recording or spoken word content. And another class that I offer there is called ACX Audiobook Production Using Audacity. And it's a deep dive into Audacity for ACX audiobooks, which the requirements for ACX audiobooks are considerably different than the requirements for a podcast. So there's only a few days left for that sale, a 50% off sale on both of those courses. You can enter the code MADNESS to take advantage of that. The links are below, and when you get to Audacity Bootcamp at audacitybootcamp.com, you'll see those coupons printed there, and you can use those to get 50% off of the already low prices. So I hope to see you there, and until next week, you all take care. Mm -hmm.